Greetings in Jesus' name. We are glad that you've chosen to join us this in this particular study. We are going to be looking specifically at Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And I trust that the study itself will prove profitable. We are thankful that you've chosen to join us. And we do look forward when you are able to gather once more on Sunday mornings with your church family. During this period of natural turmoil, of national turmoil, we might ask ourselves, is Jesus the only response we have to the pain and hurt surrounding us? Well, no, it isn't our only response, but it is our first response. And if we do not lead with the gospel, we will eventually lose the gospel. The great fire of Rome broke out and destroyed much of the city of Rome in the year AD 64. Despite the well-known stories, there is no evidence that the Roman emperor Nero either started the fire or played the fiddle while it burned. Still, he did use the disaster to further his political agenda. The fire began in the slums of a district south of the legendary Palatine Hill. The area's homes burned very quickly and the fire spread north, fueled by high winds. During the chaos of the fire, there were reports of heavy looting. The fire ended up raging out of control for nearly three days. Three of Rome's 14 districts were completely wiped out. Only four were untouched by the tremendous fire. Hundreds of people died in the fire and many thousands were left homeless. Legend has long blamed Nero for a couple of reasons. Nero did not like the aesthetics of the city and used the devastation of the fire in order to change much of it and institute new building codes throughout the city. Nero also used the fire to clamp down on the growing influence of Christians in Rome. He arrested, tortured, and executed hundreds of Christians on the pretext that they had something to do with the fire. This moment, which you and I are living in, will be leveraged to decrease and weaken the structural church, but it will only increase and strengthen the organic church. Evil will use lawlessness to suppress the gospel. But what they mean for evil, God is working for good. Some might accuse the church of fiddling while Rome burns. Some might say our gospel response is a non-response. We respond by saying that if we do not lead with the gospel, we will eventually lose the gospel. Yet what has been our response in the past? What is to be our response now? And what is our response to be tomorrow? Let us for a moment listen to the word of God. This is the word from God for us. Let us lean into our present study. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 reads as follows. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 12 read as follows. And again, listen to the language of how the Jesus seed is always producing gospel fruit. There is this connection between these two ideas. One is causation, one is consequence. There's always this sequence, but you cannot change the order. But listen to how Hebrews 6, verses 9 through 12 states this. But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation. Though we are speaking in this way, for God is not unjust as so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises." The idea of the Jesus seed producing gospel fruit is a non-negotiable. Yet this consequence or display isn't something that you can do, but something that he does. We can rest now and forevermore in his finished work. Yet his work is certain and it is powerful. It is efficacious. He will do it and he is doing it. What does the gospel of the spirit look like in us and through us to those around us? Well, we will look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and it's important to understand the context in which that statement is made. You'll remember from our study in chapters 5 and 6 that there is a gospel of the flesh. 
there is this gospel of circumcision, and then there is the gospel of the Spirit, the gospel of crucifixion. One relies heavily on the letter of the law, the other one on the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does this gospel of the Spirit look like in us and through us to those around us? This passage tells us, and what it says is something we need to hear right now in our present context. Listen to how the Apostle John notes this dynamic, this relationship between the Jesus seed and the gospel fruit. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, the Bible reads as follows. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and sisters. But if anyone has the world's goods and see his brother or sister in need, yet closes his heart against them, how does God love's, God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk only, but in deed and in truth. Working out faith through love is intrinsic to salvation. The two are inseparable, yet neither one is sourced by us. It is sourced by God through us. We are the instruments through which the gospel becomes known and is visually seen. Listen to Galatians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. The gospel isn't only the word, but the deed and the truth. However, just because we do not jump into our current public anarchy or enter into cultural debate via social media or align with visceral denunciations does not mean we are not responding. As we will see, we are to respond to all of this discord with non-judgmental attitudes toward Christians who differ with us. We should be assisting those who have been overcome. We should be faithfully responding to our own responsibilities within our own circle of influence, and we should continue with our generosity toward the church. We respond to evil by doing good, by praying for those who despitefully use us. This is how we visually see the gospel. But let's begin by reading Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10, and then we'll have a word of prayer and then jump into the study proper. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, and we'll note the literary context in which these two verses are found. But Paul says in verse 9, of Galatians 6, and let us not grow weary of doing good. Paul's referencing the idea in Galatians chapter 5, verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And then verses 1 through 5 in chapter 6, Paul says, bear one another's burdens, and then bear your own burden. And then 6 through 8, Paul says, let's continue to give generosity generously. Let us finance the gospel of the Spirit. And then he says, let us continue in that good work. Verse 9, and let us not grow weary of doing this good toward one another, for in due season, as opportunity is afforded, we will reap if we do not give up. Verse 10, our primary verse for this study, so then, as we have opportunity, as we have season, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So the Apostle Paul describes for us what that good is, and then he exhorts us to continue that good, not just internally toward our own particular family, our church family, but then to the community at large. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours to be gathered around your word. We ask that the Spirit of God would use the word of God and do a sure work in the people of God. And then Father, as you have given to us this spirit and that spirit is working in us and through us, may we see that go out to those around us. So thank you, Father, for this time. May we continue to lead with the gospel. We do ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are looking in particular at verse 10, but we're looking at verses 9 and 10 as well. In Galatians, the Apostle Paul uses two words for good. And we see both of those words in verses 9 and 10. Paul says, and let us not grow weary of doing good. In verse 9, that word is kalos. And then in verse 10, he uses the word agathos. They're two different Greek words, but they are combined here, and they are perhaps working synonyms. In verse 9, the word kalos has the idea of beautiful. There's this beautiful work that we do one toward another, this idea of loving one another. It's a beautiful work. It's morally beautiful. And then in the word agathos in verse 10 speaks of the beneficial, 
that beautiful act, that good work in verse 9, is a beneficial, profitable good work in verse 10. These two words are working together to describe what we are to be doing one toward another and to the community at large. Thus, the beautiful thing, the beautiful thing is a beneficial thing, and the beautiful benefit is coming out of the Jesus seed. That is the gospel fruit. That gospel fruit that is worked toward one another is a beautiful thing, and it is a beneficial thing, and that's what we are looking at in our present study. But let's look at the structure of this text as it is found in verse 10. We're beginning with this thought or idea that there is a season, and notice the language in verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, as we have season, there is a season for the beautiful. There is a season for doing the good. And then there is this action that is identified as good, as beautiful. What exactly is that thing called good or beautiful? And then finally, who are the recipients for the beautiful? Who are the recipients for the beautiful? Who are the ones that are receiving this good that is done? And what I find of interest in Galatians 6, 9, and 10, it's almost a conclusion or summary statement, and it's anchored to what has preceded. So whatever Paul is saying in Galatians 5 up until this point is how Paul describes this work. It is a good work. And what is that good work? Well, it's bearing one another's burdens. It's not being conceited or arrogant toward others who differ with you. It is bearing your own burden carrying out your own responsibilities. It is giving generously to gospel-rich ministries and those who are serving in that way. So 9 and 10 are the flower that's opening in the dew of the morning sun. This is what that looks like. And Paul exhorts us to lead in that way. But let's begin with this idea of a season for beautiful. There is a season for beautiful. Ephesians 5.16 uses this idea to capture the same idea, making the best use of time. And why? Because the days are evil. So while we have opportunity, let us do the good. And why? Because the days are evil, Ephesians 5.16. Colossians 4.5 says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Verse 10 of Galatians 6 says, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, to outsiders. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Why? Making the best use of the time. Paul says there's a season for this good to be done. But what is that season? Is it simply the opportunity as we think, well, there's an occasion right now appearing before me that I could address? Or is Paul speaking of something else? Paul is really speaking of something else. He says right now, the time in which we live is the season for the doing of good. Why? Well, because there is a hard stop coming. There is a hard stop coming. When Jesus Christ returns, and that return is soon, all these opportunities, all the seasons that we are now afforded will be gone. Right now is the time for us to do the good because a hard stop is coming. Jesus Christ is returning. A day is coming when none of this will matter, and that day is the hard stop set by God. And all of us as believers are praying for the soon return of Jesus. But when Jesus does return, every opportunity or season for good will be done. So there is a season for the beautiful. There is a time for this good work to be done. Now let's consider the second idea. There is first a season for the beautiful, but secondly, there is an action. There's an actual action called beautiful called good. What is this? Well, the first and highest vertical good is the gospel. The gospel is the greatest good. That's why if we do not lead with the gospel, we will eventually lose the gospel. And the gospel isn't our only response, but it is our first response because the gospel is the greatest good. We might look for opportunities or platforms to serve, but somehow that service begins to eclipse the gospel. So we have to lead with the gospel, and the fruit of that gospel is the common good, is the good. Paul emphasizes a certain truth throughout the book of Galatians. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, he says, faith working through love. Chapter 5, verse 13, but through love serve one another. Chapter 5, verse 14, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. 
Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, we are told to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is this idea of an unconditional love for other people. Such a love as described in Galatians stops biting and devouring. Such a love makes no provision for the flesh. Such a love reveals the fruit of the Spirit. Such a love bears one another's burdens. Such a love gives generously to gospel-rich ministries. This is what that love does. That is the beautiful thing. Galatians 5.26, do not be conceited. That is the beautiful thing. Bearing one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 1 through 5. That's the beautiful thing. Supporting the gospel of the Spirit in 6 through 8 of Galatians 6 is the beautiful thing. How do we go about loving one another? Well, let me suggest to you three uh, practical thoughts or ideas concerning this. As an individual, the Spirit of God is working in you and through you to those, those around you. But be teachable. Be teachable. Why? Because you do not know everything. Secondly, be humble. Why? Because you could be wrong. And as we noted last week, there is this assault or attack against the unity of the church. Thus, we need to be teachable. We need to be humble. And finally, we need to be charitable. Why? Because love is always the proper response. So there is this action called beautiful. It's when we are teachable. It's when we are humble. It's when we are charitable toward one another. And when we do that, we're no longer arrogant. We're no longer conceited. We are looking for opportunity to bear one another's burdens. And we are living generous, God-focused lives. So the Apostle Paul describes in verse 10 our gospel response. And that gospel response does bear fruit. And that fruit is beautiful. And that fruit is beneficial, not just to ourselves not just to one another, but to the community at large. And then finally, notice how the verse reads. It says, so then as we have opportunity right now, because the hard stops coming, Jesus is returning. And when he does return, we will no longer have a season or an opportunity for extending the good. And the first good, the greatest good is the gospel. We know that there is an action called beautiful as described in Galatians 5 and 6. And we know that we need to be in this current season teachable, humble, and always charitable. But now, who are the recipients for the beautiful? Notice what Paul says. Notice how he describes this in verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, as the season now exists, let us do the good. Let us do the beautiful to everyone. And especially, he puts a qualifier there, and I'll note that in just a moment, to those who are of the household of faith. The Apostle Paul says that the recipients of the good are the community at large and then the household of faith. That household of faith begins with your own immediate family, and then it is to the family of families in which you exist as a local church. And then from there and through the church, it goes to the community at large. This is the good that we are to be doing to everyone, everywhere, at all times. But there is a progression to this beautiful and beneficial action, which I find interesting from this. Paul draws a distinction between all people and then the household of faith with the word especially or chiefly. We are not to turn a deaf ear to the plight of the needy within our own community, but our primary application of the good is toward our immediate family and then the family of faith. And, and I'll expand that and, and unpack it in just a moment. But let us consider this thought of the community at large. How do we do the beneficial to the community at large? There are no barriers or prohibitions or restraints for the extension of mercy and grace to those in need. The gospel and its fruit are for everyone, everywhere, at all times. And yet we must know, we must understand that our first response is the gospel. Because if the gospel is not our first response, we will eventually lose the gospel. If we do not lead with the gospel, we lose the gospel. Notice how Jesus pushes together this idea of doing the good. He pushes together what the devil pulls apart when he talks about Samaritans. 
In Luke chapter 10, verse 33, he gives us the parable, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And Jesus is, in a sense, accenting and celebrating, as it were, this Jewish-Samaritan division. In Luke 17, 16, and he fell on his face, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. Now, why is this idea of a Samaritan being emphasized? Because John 4, 9 says, Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? And then John 8, 48, the Jews answered and said to him, Do we not say rightly that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? There was already this division between ethnicities or between Samaritans and Jews that existed in the days of Jesus. And Jesus shows how we should be doing the good to everyone, everywhere, regardless. Think of the cold water language that's used in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of water to drink, Truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. In Matthew 25, verses 33 through 40, it's an extended passage. But let me read for us verse 35. You have sheep and goats. And he says to the sheep, for I was hungry. The sheep were wondering, well, how is it that you've noticed in a sense me? Well, verse 35, it says, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Now that's not simply the household of faith. That's the community at large. And the sheep were those who were ministering to their community. They were fulfilling this idea. 6.10 in Galatians is reflecting that same idea or thought in Matthew 25. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And that's what we read of in Matthew 25. There is the good action. I find the passage interesting. There's, he is speaking to those who are already sheep. The act did not create the condition. It is the condition of being a sheep that caused the act. They describe what Christians do. Christians, the church, have always been at the forefront of alleviating human suffering. Christians do not run from need. They run to the need. However, this passage is not telling us to start ministries that focus on these specific needs. It is telling us to minister to those in need without qualifier. These are the kinds of needs you might find in any community. And there is something we do for the sake of the gospel, because of the gospel, that is indeed beautiful and beneficial. We have seen this historically. We see it in the present, and I know we will see it in the future. Christians are not running from need. They are running to the need. There is one category that separates the community at large, and that is the household of faith. And no matter how we see humanity at large and how society at large seeks to divide it, there are only two groups, two categories, two qualifiers. One is either a believer in Jesus Christ or one is someone who rejects Jesus Christ. So on one hand, you have the community at large, the unbelieving community, and then you have the household of faith, the believing community. So we've already noted how we are to be speaking the gospel to the community at large and that the fruit of the gospel are these good deeds, is the common good, the beneficial, the beautiful. But then listen to this idea of the household of faith. The family of faith, the Christian household or church, is our primary emphasis, doing good has a universal application to all, but the local community makes specific the reality of those to who we are to be serving. We are serving those within our own household. There's this emphasis that I find very interesting in our text. It says here that we are to, especially to those who are of the household of faith. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, I believe the household of faith, it drills down, as it were, to us specifically. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, his family, especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. This is what we are to be focusing on first. And this whole idea, folks, a family is the first mission field. Family is, in a sense, the first object of our attention. But family first does not mean family only. None of this is an 
either or idea. What begins in the home, in the home, is then brought through the church to the community at large. So that Jesus seed is always producing gospel fruit, and it begins in the home, and then it comes through the church and then to the community. This is the progression. And our first, as it were, mission field is always our immediate family. Those are the ones who are to be the benefactors of this beautiful act or these beautiful acts. And then the family of faith. In James chapter 2, 14 through 16, I'll just read verses 14 and 15. It says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food? And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, and be filled. And yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? So the message in the New Testament is that we are to do good to everyone everywhere. But we have a primary, a first responsibility to those within our immediate family and then to the family of families, and then through the family of families to the community at large. And it isn't an either-or proposition or idea. We should be endeavoring to do all of that at the same time. Now, I understand it's impossible sometimes as individuals, but as a church, it is something that we can do. How might we go about addressing the needs of our family of families? The apostle says, so then as we have opportunity, as we have season, which is right now, let us do the good. Let us do the beautiful to everyone, but especially to the household of faith. It begins in the home, and then it comes through the church, and then to the community. But what might that look like as we seek to address the needs of our own family? And remember, Uh, Galatians 5 and 6 gives us very specific thoughts. Don't be conceited. Don't be arrogant towards those with whom you differ. Bear the burdens of one another. Seek to enable as much as possible. Carry your own burden. Carry out your own responsibilities. And then give generously. And that might be your time. It might be your finances. But give generously to gospel-rich ministries. But what might that look like inside of our own family of families? Well, let me suggest to you what is already going on. Visiting the homebound, shopping for the homebound, driving for the homebound, providing Stephen ministers for those who need support in their journey, providing grief ministry for those who need support in their loss, providing outside Christian counseling for those who need outside support, provide financial assistance for those within our family of families who are unable to meet pressing financial needs through our benevolent offering. Providing meals for those who are unable to care for themselves because of hospitalization or structural change within their families. And helping people move from one place to another. All of these are beautiful acts that we do internally one for another. It's what we are currently doing for our own family of families. And it doesn't take, as my son said last week, it doesn't take an astronomer to see the moon, but you would have to be a fool not to see the sun. There's tons of good taking place. Is there more that we can do? Absolutely, because the need will never leave us until Jesus returns. Until he returns, we have these seasons, we have this opportunity for the good. But let us not conclude that nothing is being done. I was recently asked how many people volunteer at Waukesha Bible Church. Well, my response was that all the people are busy serving somewhere and someone. More than most quietly serve the programming at WBC, but many serve elsewhere, and all are working to serve their immediate families. It's absolutely amazing. Anytime the staff or the elders begin looking for people who they might be able to tap to work somewhere, well, most of the people in our fellowship are already serving somewhere. That's what this is all about. So what for us is the next step? Paul says, as you have season, as you have opportunity, let's do the good. First to your own immediate family, then through the family of families to the community at large. So what might this look like for us? Well, first of all, do not put yourself, in the midst of all this, do not put yourself on some kind of spiritual pedestal. Stop looking down on and or judging individuals who differ with you. You on a very practical level, for example, our attitude towards others who differ with us concerning the coronavirus Well, let's be careful concerning our attitude towards them or even with all that is currently transpiring in our community. 
there are a multiplicity or a polarizing of opinions. Well, let's be gracious and let's not be arrogant or judgmental towards those with whom we differ. Secondly, on a personal level, as you are aware of those whose burdens have buckled their knees, see how you might step in and help. It's something we do regularly, but how might you get involved? We work to do this through your enablement on a corporate level, but how might we do this? How might you do this? Rather than judging those with whom you might differ concerning the virus, how might we encourage and support and serve them, regardless of what their attitude or opinion is concerning the virus? And then finally, let's continue being generous with our ability to serve and or financially gift the church. This is what Paul is calling us to. Let me conclude with two verses. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, a very familiar verse, verse 8, but verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the good work, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word workmanship references a product or the fabric of something. The thing that God creates, the thing that God produces, the thing that God makes is beautiful. You are that thing. And this beautiful thing is a beneficial thing. God has done a work both in us and through us to those around us. And that is what this text is celebrating. There is this consistent story throughout the entire scripture. And then finally, Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, again, a very familiar verse, but it says in the same way, let your light shine before others, and that light is the good work, so that they may see your good work, your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As you and I carry out the gospel, that gospel bears a fruit. That fruit is a beautiful fruit. It is a good fruit. And that good fruit, that good work, is a beneficial thing. And when other people see that good work, they glorify our Father, which is in heaven. That is why we must always lead with the gospel, because if we don't lead with the gospel, we will lose the gospel. It is the Jesus seed that produces this gospel fruit, and that gospel fruit is a beautiful thing. And that gospel fruit glorifies our Father, who is in heaven. Some would say we are hiding behind the gospel. Well, are we? If leading with the gospel is hiding behind the gospel, then absolutely, we are hiding behind the gospel. Yet we believe we are acting, but not in a way that discounts or discredits the gospel and God. There is a good to be done in our community and within our church. And let us lean into this. Let us bend our ear toward it and let us quietly go about serving one another Because in so doing, we are glorifying our Father who is in heaven. When we are told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone, well, that gospel preached bears gospel fruit. And that's what we are about. Christianity says that Jesus Christ is enough for this life and in the life which is to come. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have had to gather around this thought, your word. And I pray that we would always be affirming, confessing that this is the word of God. And that, Father, we would bend our ears towards it, that we would lean into the word. And now, Father, let us search and study and examine and even question what was said and compare it against the scripture. Does this ring true throughout the scripture? That has been our intent that the Jesus seed is producing a gospel fruit. And that gospel fruit is efficacious. It is powerful. It is productive, both in our immediate home and then through the church to our community. And may we be aggressive in examining how we can bring the gospel, knowing that that gospel produces good. Thank you, Father, for this time together in our study. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. And until our next study, stay the course.